Welcome back to IGN Live at E3 2018. Joining me is Almir Listo, producer at Overkill, and we are checking out Overkill's The Walking Dead. I have to confess, I'm a big Payday veteran. And very when cool. I got to play this yesterday, I was very happy, but it is very dissimilar to Payday in some respects. So talk me through the gameplay of Overkill's The Walking Dead. All right, thanks for having me. So uh, Overkill's The Walking Dead is a four-player cooperative uh, first-person shooter set in The Walking Dead universe. We worked closely together with Robert Kirkman, the creator of The Walking Dead, on making these characters as believable uh, and as, as big of a part of the universe as possible. And I'm happy to say that he likes them so much that we have his blessing. They're a part of the canon of They're the They're part of book. the canon. That's got to be very exciting for your narrative team. Yeah, of course. And it's a huge compliment to the development team back home in Sweden working hard on the game <coughs> because uh, we've been working on this game. and. Uh, we're here at E3 showing uh, the first playable version of it, uh, an internal beta that we're having. Uh, so it's a great play test for us, seeing all the Walking Dead fans and <laughs> paid veterans like yourself being able to check it out and uh, hands-on, you know, try out the gameplay for themselves and try to survive in a post-apocalyptic Washington, D.C. So we're seeing some melee gameplay here. I'm a big yeah. fan of the shooting in Payday, Payday 2, yeah. and The Walking Dead. I liked it quite a lot. Uh, so talking through the melee combat, why are you incentivized to use melee in yeah, Overkill's so The Walking Dead? When we designed uh, Overkill's The Walking Dead together with Robert, uh, we wanted to stay true to the universe. And if you read the comic books, you understand that uh, the world has ended, and thus not that much things work anymore. So you have to make do with what you can find. You, the ammo will be scarce, weapons will break, suppressors will break, scopes will be dirty. You might have difficulties looking down in them when you're going to shoot. And uh, utilizing melee combat and melee, melee weapons <coughs> is uh, your best choice when, uh, when you want to make sure you don't want to attract any attention. Because the more noise you make, the more walkers you're going to attract. And we're going to speak about that later in yeah. some great detail. I had, a, I had a lot of fun with the noise meter here. Yeah. Uh, so another interesting thing about these characters is that they have kind of tools unique to their archetype. Yeah. Instead of like having like a tank or a mage and the you know, traditional D&D &D archetypes, you have archetypes that rely on uh, skills like having wire cutters or having a lockpick. What does that get you if you're able to use those abilities in the game? So uh, you could say that the game is divided into two big things. One thing is that you have the camp that you're a part of. You could almost say that it's a fifth character, because the camp can also evolve as you continue playing the game. And just like in any good Walking Dead story, the group of survivors try to make a, a good life in this post-apocalyptic ap setting, but conflict arises. So in the demo we're showing here at E3, the, uh, the survivors uh, have to find a water purifier that has been stolen by a rival bandit faction <laughs> called, the ba uh, yeah, called the family. So we have to get it back. And while we do that, we're on, we might as well scavenge the Georgetown, which we have to go through in order to get to them. So as you go through the level, you will find loot and other things that you can use, not only to create the weapons you were talking about and lockpicks and other things, but also to bring back to the camp to, in order to upgrade it further. So I had an experience where I had a, a fantastic revolver, really loud though, and then I had an MP5 that was suppressed, and eventually my suppressor broke off, yeah. which is terrifying because there's this meter at the top of the screen when you make noise. Tell me what that meter is all about, and once it gets to three pips, what happens? I'm happy you noticed. This is you know, one of the cool things our design team has put together at Overkill and Starbreeze. So, uh, Staying true to the universe of The Walking Dead has been one of the most important pillars for us making this game. And because we want to make sure the action is intense, while at the same time uh, retaining an ebb and flow gameplay where there are calm moments and there are intense moments, we came up with the idea to utilize this noise meter, as you call it, or the, uh, we internally call it the hordometer. Because <laughs> uh, what it does is that it symbolizes the attention in the world that, you are get, that your group is getting. So the more noise you make, or the more noise the bandits make, or something else happens, for example, maybe a car alarm goes off, or someone starts to shoot in the air, and it might not be you, uh, <coughs> the noise is going to increase, and more walkers are going to be attracted. So we're picking up fuses here, and we are depositing them into what appears to be a generator. Uh, what is the goal here? So the goal here is that uh, you're going through the Georgetown district, and right now the uh, uh, survivors are trying to look for the hideout. And in order to look for them further, they have to pass a gate. And there are small puzzles like these through the entire game where we want players to use tactics and to find, uh, find solutions to ways going forward through the level. Because usually there will be m multiple options for players. They can either choose to stealth, 
uh, an area and try to just pass through it without making any noise. Or you can always go in guns blazing, throwing grenades, and yeah. That's always my badass. style. I must yeah. have played uh, Hector Mendoza's Rats mission a hundred yeah. times in Payday. Payday 2, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so talk to me about the arsenal yeah. uh, of Overkill's The Walking Dead. I think one of the really interesting things is in Payday, you know, you're, it's, it's almost like heat. You're just strapped, you're ready to go. But in Overkill's The Walking Dead, you're scavenging, you're looking for weapons. They're a lot more weathered. So what we, can we expect in terms of firearms? It's a really good question. Weapons in a first-person shooter matter. They mean a lot to players, and we respect that. That's why we put so much energy and effort into Payday 2, making the amount of weapons we did, making the weapon customization as we did. And I'm happy to say that in Overkill's The Walking Dead, we're taking that further with us into the game. So the team has come up with some really, really cool options that we look forward to talking more about when we get closer to launch. But there will be different kinds of weapons. There will be your sniper rifles. There will be the suppressed shotguns. There will be the pistols, the crossbows, and anything you can find in order to survive in, in this setting. Speaking of sniper rifles, we're going to see a player scope in on a different enemy here. This is a human. Yeah. And uh, when I shot that nest of bandits, and they all aggroed. I freaked out. I thought they were just walkers. Yeah. Uh, but tell me what is threatening about yeah. other human players in The Walking Dead. Funny you say that, because people who have been playing the game at our booth here in the West Hall, uh, all of them have been saying, like, you know, you come into the game, and you see the first few walkers, no problem. You beat them down with a few baseball bats. Maybe you got a stick or a machete. And then you, as you come <coughs> further, you start to notice that, hey, there's humans here, because you can see bear traps, other kinds of traps that have been laid out. And that's not walker behavior. And people usually think that the walkers are the biggest threat in the Walking Dead universe. They're not. It's the humans. The humans, uh, you don't know what they want, but you always know what a walker wants. They just want to eat you up, right? But the humans, they have an agenda. And in this case, there's conflict with the family. So can we sneak through that part? Can we sneak through uh, a lot of the level? And then let me ask, for those of us like myself who love going loud through the entire level, will there be missions that allow me to do that? Because I did notice that ammo is very, it's very sparse commodity, yeah. very valuable. True, yeah. And it's, uh, it's like a battle of attrition in a sense. Uh, you could say that what we've designed the game to be is that we want it to be difficult and we want it to be challenging for players that uh, want a good challenge and want good fun. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to be give players the opportunity to jump in together, pick the skills that they want, pick the weapons that complement that setup, because depending on what kind of group we are, we utilize different weapons, and go in utilizing stealth or not, try and try to finish the missions the best way they can. Uh, like, uh, like I said, it's, it's such a... <coughs> It's such a fun thing for us being fans of the comic books to make levels, missions, in the Walking Dead universe, because everything has a purpose, right? You, you, you asked about stealth, and of course you can stealth as far as possible, but probably at some point a human person will see you, or you will you know, end up you know, uh, popping a up a trap, trap or something, yeah. right, yeah. Or like I saw one play player mistakenly throwing a flashbang, getting everyone's attention <laughs> at the wrong time, and just you know, diverting the action completely. That's great. Let's switch gears here and talk about the narrative. Obviously, this is set in Skybound's Walking Dead universe. Mm. There are a ton of fans of the comic, as well as the TV show. Yeah. Are we going to see any characters returning from other mediums uh, in your game? That's a really good question. For Overkill's The Walking Dead, for launch, we are focusing on telling our own original story. That's where our focus is. But we're really happy that we got Robert's blessing on making the game canon, meaning that the game plays out in the same universe as his other characters in the comic books. So that's where we are now. However, in the future, our goal is to continue with the development of the game uh, with a lifeline, that we call it. Because you being a Payday player, you know how hard we've continued to work on Payday 2 post-launch. I mean, Great. the game came out in 2013. And to this day, we have 190 updates. We're still working on new free content for the community. And we aim to do the same with Overkill's The Walking Dead in the Walking Dead universe. And you know, the amount of times we've talked with Robert and his team about this and getting excited about the opportunity we have to delve further into The Walking Dead with universe with the community in a first-person setting, I mean, that's really cool to us. All right, bad news, Elmir. We've attracted walkers. Uh, the horde is on its way. I can see that. Or maybe it's just walkers in the immediate area. So what? happens when I aggroed the horde, there were innumerable amounts of them, so many yeah. that it almost seemed impossible to yeah. pass. So is it possible to, to get your noise meter all the way up, uh, aggro the horde, and still make it through the mission? We're going to talk more about the noise meter as we get closer to the launch. But I think uh, um, 
you when when you <laughs> it's you could almost argue that it's uh, the the difficulty because of it becomes dynamic in a sense because the more noise you make the more workers are gonna appear and the harder it's probably gonna get and I'm saying probably because if you're stealth enough if you're agile enough with your team and coordinate enough you can run through it right so the difficulty is not an arbitrary thing. It's a living, breathing thing, or a living, well, undying thing. Well, it's the walkers <laughs> walking around the level. So uh, we promise the play payday players that if they are into doing heists, then they definitely should check this out because of the tactical first-person shooter gameplay. We've really gone in a really cool direction with this game. And uh, yeah, we think people are going to like it. Fantastic. One of my things about Payday is inspiring interesting team play, yeah. making sure you watch each other's back. What are you doing in The Walking Dead to maintain that feeling of yeah. uh, necessity to yeah. communicate with your team? Yeah. How did it go for you when you played? Did you have fun? What yeah, happened? Yeah, so I, uh, I was trying to communicate. I was there with uh, uh, IGN and product creator uh, yeah. Kate Feebing. Yeah. We were communicating. We were talking. We were like, I have this thing, and I have this thing, <laughs> yeah. and I can make it through this gate. And the other two guys with us, I don't think, spoke English. So there was kind of half the team was on one page, half the team was on the other. So it was rough. Just like in The Walking Dead, right? That's a beautiful story, you know, from The Walking Dead universe, because not all groups are going to get along, you know? Not all survivors uh, uh, are going to be best friends or might not be able to communicate properly or whatever. But you have to survive. And that's why you stick together. And right. that, that, that's the cool thing about the gameplay, because that's what we've built the game towards. That's really exciting. I know you may not be able to talk about some of this, but uh, a great part of Payday and Payday 2 is the progression. Mm -hmm. Is starting out with a weapon that you feel okay about and getting to a place where you've really refined your kit, refined your archetype. Will there be progression for your character in The Walking Dead? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, the purpose of the game, other than being based in The Walking Dead universe and being a great action romp together with your friends, is that we want to continue giving players tools to level up their characters and experience the world in different ways. Uh, there will be, uh, we will talk more about the specific progression system and how it's affected and, uh, and how the skill trees and look and so forth. But right now our focus is just getting people into the action and seeing what people think about the gameplay. Yeah, yeah. really exciting. Uh, let's speak about how you kill a walker. For those yeah. of us who haven't seen The Walking Dead, you have to take them down in a specific way. Does that translate to your game? Do you need to get all headshots? All hits to the head. Can you shoot a walker 100 times in the chest and it'd still be walking? Maybe not 100 times, <laughs> but they definitely, yeah. We've, been, we've taken great detail. Our artists have done such a great job, the technical artist team and the artist team, on making sure we portray walkers in, a, in, a, in a, as best of a way we can. Because they're horrific when they come up close and you can shoot off their limbs. We have a, a dismemberment system, if you will. So uh, if you shoot one in the leg and the leg drops, they fall to the ground, but they still want you. So they crawl towards you, right? Yes, they're going yeah, like to bite you, yeah. your feet. And I had that yeah, exactly. a whole bunch. Uh, so talk me through, we see we're uh, firing a flare here. What is this accomplishing? So the flare is a part of the mission, and we'll jump deeper into those kind of things when we come closer to launch, yeah. So in terms of mission variants, uh, Payday had a really good mission variants. There were a lot of stealth missions. You had to yeah. go in and maintain stealth. There were some crazy loud missions. What are you excited in terms of designing your levels uh, in The Walking Dead as far as variance is concerned? I'm excited because when we made Payday back in the day, we were a, a different group of developers, and the Overkill team and Starbase team has grown so much with so many great talents from different studios and countries around the world. So the Overkill crew we see today is such a great mix of talent, senior and junior, working together to create this really, really cool experience. So for me, having been a part of Payday for such a long time, seeing our team work together, creating these really cool levels, yeah, it's definitely something else. And I think if you're a Payday fan, you should definitely check it out, you know, because if you like what we've done in the past, this is definitely going to be up your alley. Let's speak about crafting. Yeah. Uh, it's not a crazy crafting system where I have to go to a workbench and bang out like an iron helmet, but you are gathering resources and you are crafting things to help you along your journey. So what can you craft? Yeah, so the crafting system uh, is supposed to do two things, really. Help you in the, in the mission you're playing by crafting additional bombs or what have you and uh, helping you uh, uh, upgrade your camp further. And we wanted the crafting system to be uh, important but also not deter from the gameplay. So we want people to be able to have fun, but not feel that they have to go and do something else for two, three, four, or five minutes every time, and, and they don't like that as much. So we've tried to incorporate it as much as we can into the gameplay, so you actively have to look for the things, but they also are rewarding when you actually activate them as well. Let me ask you, what are you most excited for people uh, to experience when they get their hands on Overkill's The Walking Dead? For me personally, the most exciting thing will be uh, seeing people uh, starting play for real when we get closer to launch on the 6th of November. Because that's when the real work starts. 
our, our philosophy working on video games is that we want to do games as service. We want to continue working on the game <laughs> post-launch. So seeing the reaction on the stories that we have wanted to tell through the, uh, the, the uh, launch gameplay that will be available, and then working on more content together with the community and exploring the Walking Dead universe further. What's going on in Washington, D.C.? What can we find there? Where's the government? There are so many unanswered questions in the Walking Dead universe that we want to explore together with Robert and the rest of the Walking Dead community. Elmir, I cannot wait to answer those questions when it comes out on the 6th of November. Thank you so much for joining me. Stick Thanks. around because we have so much more E3 2018 here on IGN. The IGN app is the best way to stay up to the minute on what you love. No matter what you play, create the custom feed and filter what you want to watch. Live streams have never been easier to find. With the floating video player on iOS, you can keep watching the live stream as you read other news. World premiere trailers and the biggest games. Download the IGN app from the iOS or Android stores now. Sign up for notifications and we'll alert you the second news breaks. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app, YouTube, Facebook, or Snapchat, we've always got you covered. IGN, the number one source for all games and entertainment fans worldwide. If you're not following IGN on social media, what are you waiting for? <laughs> We're bringing the memes, gameplay, custom original content, the best user-generated videos and art, and a whole lot more. Be part of the conversation throughout the year. Follow IGN on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Before you find IGN's awesome content anywhere else online, you'll find it right at home on IGN.com. With IGN First, you'll get a sneak peek at never-before-seen gameplay, exclusive insights from developers, and a whole lot more. NVC Live brings you IGN's Nintendo podcast up close and personal. Engage with other viewers, ask our NVC hosts your burning questions, and become a part of the show. Don't miss out. Find everything first on IGN.com. IGN Live at E3 2018 is presented by Marvel Studios' Ant-Man and the Wasp in theaters July 6. Welcome back to IGN Live at E3 2018. It's time to take a look at one of my most anticipated games, Bloodstained. Igarashi himself is here to tell us all about it, and Mana will be translating for us today. Welcome back to the IGN stage. Uh, you're welcome, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, I believe the demo you have for E3 this year picks up where the last demo uh, left off, is that correct? えっと、あの、今回出してる、あの、出展してるデモは、えっと、以前の出展されたデモから、えっと、続きなんですかえっとですね、今回のデモはですね、え、ゲームの本編の、え、今までのやつはちょっと切り取ったものだったんですけれども
ドラマとかも入ってるんですけどもそこから船はその村に着きまして悪魔に荒らされた村がまずありますでそこを過ぎてそこから城へと侵入していきます So after you get off the ship, you'll see a village that was actually attacked by enemies and demons. So you'll see a village that's burning and everything, and it, it goes all the way to the castle entrance where you start your adventure. I see.、Uh, so I believe the character we play as is named Miriam. Who is she? What's, she, what's her story? What's she after? えっと、今回のその主人公ミリアムっていうのはえっとど,うどういう人物ですか何がえっと目的で今回は城に向かっていますか、はいえー、と彼女は、えー、とこの、まあ、10年前に悪魔を召喚する儀式があったんですけれどもその時に生贄にされるはずだった、まあ、シャードバインダーの一人なんですねで彼女はその10年前にその、えーまあ、眠っていたことでちょっと、まあ、魔法的に眠らされていたことでその儀式の生贄になることはなかったんですけれどもその儀式の生贄の生き残りだったジーベルという同じ仲間がいるんですけどもその彼が今回この悪魔を召喚をさせるのでその彼を止めるために彼女は、えー、この城に向かっていきます。So, Miriam is actually、uh, a character that was actually used for、uh, a ritual sacrifice.、Mm. But she was,、um, this is a little bit of a spoiler, but <laughs> I mean, it, she was actually、um, in this deep sleep and she was、uh, about to be used as a sacrifice, but she was able to sort of,、um, she, she was able to survive.、Mm. And she, now she's、um, trying to defeat mo- enemies that, are,、um, try- that were going to use her as a sacrifice. Does she, do we know why they were attempting to sacrifice her? Why did they want to sacrifice her? そのためにそのまさにその生贄のために作られた人間なんです。So、um, to give you a little bit of a background story, this、um, the setting is in an industrial revolution. And when I thought about、um, who would be at a disadvantage during the industrial revolution, I was thinking of people that are、um, in the spiritual sort of、um, kind of like、uh, more of a magic. Sort of, um, and people that are like alchemists. Alchemists would be at a disadvantage of during this industrial revolution where technology is booming. So, when I thought about that, and、um, when alchemists are at a disadvantage, they want people to have,、um, they want to save their identity. So, they want to sort of have people、um, sort of focus,、uh, well, they want them to have a demand for them. And that's why they decided we're going to use、uh, sacrifices in order to summon demons so that people will need our help. So that's,、wow. what, that's where Miriam comes in, and she was、um, embedded these crystals where、um, she was used as a sacrifice, but、um, I guess it didn't do well. It, it, it just failed, so she was able to survive it, and that's what she's after. Interesting. Okay, so this isn't a Castlevania game, but it's very similar to the Castlevania games that you've worked on in the past.、Uh, and the ultimate enemy in those games is Dracula. Is there an ultimate enemy in Bloodstains? まあ、あの今回はあの以前のゲームで「あの悪魔城」のシリーズではえっと最終ボスがあのドラキュラだったんですけどえっと今回はそういうまあ最終的なボスまあ敵っていうのはいますか、えっと、まずその先ほど話をしましたその元仲間だったジーベルというキャラクターがいます。で彼はえっとまあ主人公ミリアムと同じ能力を持っているんですけれどもえっと彼を止めるために行きますので当然彼が一応目的になります。So actually, there was another sacrifice be,、um, other than Miriam,、mm. and this was her friend Jibo. So Jibo was, was also able to survive this ritual, and he is、um, actually the last boss, the last sort、mm. of goal that Miriam needs to defeat. I see. So, in terms of like, classic Castlevania games, there's two types、uh, more of a, a, the linear type where you move from stage to stage, much like Curse of the Moon, which was just out. Uh, and then there's the more open Metroidvania style. So, which style would you say Bloodstained is? Bloodstained is a ritual of the night. Well, I think Curse of the Moon was released in the past. So, it was a linear type of stage. But Bloodstained is a ritual of the night. So, what is the type of Metroidvania? So, what is the type of Metroidvania? 
、えー、とリチャード・オブ・ザ・ナイトはですねメトロイドバニア形式のものであの広大なマップを探索して、まあ、行ったり来たりできる、えー、タイプのゲームになります。So, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night is、um, a little bit different from Curse of the Moon, where、um, this is a Metroidvania style. So, the player will be able to explore the castle,、um, fight monsters, and be able to gen generally、um, explore the castle. Very cool. So, is this a new area we're seeing here? えっと、今回はえっと今見ているあのこの画面では新しいエリアですか、はい、これは中庭のえっと城の中の中庭のシーンになります。This is actually a, yes, a, a new area.、Um, this is a, inside the castle.、Um, it's, it's in a courtyard. I see. So, like, is this、uh, deep into the game at this point, would you say? えっと、これはえっと序盤の方ですか、mm. それともあと途中の結構あの最終の方に行くんですか、まあ、かなり序盤の方ですね。Yes, this is、um, a very beginning of the game. Oh, I see. So, I would say these Metroidvania type games, the gameplay is a lot about trying to reach the next save point. Like, seeing about how far you can go past the last save point、uh, and what you're willing to risk to make it to the next save point. Would you say that's、uh, also what Bloodstained is like? あの以前はあの結構そのメトロイドバニア系のゲームではあの次のセーブポイントまでまあそのずっと続けなくてはいけないその生き残ってはいけない生き残らないといけないっていう感じだったんですけどまあ今回はあのそういうまあ形式なものになっていますかとえっとまあそこら辺はそのまま踏襲してましてあのセーブポイントがあってそこまで頑張ってやりましょうみたいな感じではあります。So、uh, just as you said, yes, this is a game where you have to、um, survive until the next save point. So we have to work hard and to survive the castle until the next save point. And how are you approaching the weapons?、Uh, typically, these games like Symphony of the Night have a very, wide, a very large variety of weapons. Is that the case here as well? あの以前の悪魔城あの悪魔城のえっと月下の総局ではいろんな武器があの装備できましたけどえっと今回はそういういろんな武器が装備できます。えっと今回のタイトルもですねすごくたくさんいろんな武器をあの装備することができます。あの特に今回えまあいろんな本当に武器があってもう探検からロングソードから両手剣からもうたくさんあります。ガンもありますし本当にたくさんあります。So, yeah, we have a lot of different kinds of weapons. We have from the sword, the whip, and we even have a gun in this game. So, we have all different kinds of weapons. I see. Are we able to customize、uh, Miriam's appearance? Miriam is a good one. We can customize it. We can customize it. So, we can use the same thing as the graphic. So, we can use the same thing as the graphic. あのカットシーンとかでも変な帽子をかぶって出ることになるのでそこら辺は気をつけた方がいいんですがあのカスタマイズいろいろできるようになってます。Yes, her、uh, appearance is customizable and you'll see that she's able to、um, equip like、um, hats and、um, pretty much、um, the top area of her appearance would change. You could actually equip items. But、um, you have to be careful because during the cutscenes you'll see that she'll be equipping that item、mm. and、uh, you'll see it in the cutscenes. So just be careful about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then how do the shards work? Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. Shard is a kind of thing that you can use. 体に埋め込まれた結晶と力をリンクさせて、その悪魔の力を引き出すことができるそういう意思です。So um, shards are these abilities dropped by demons, and the demon when they disappear or when they die, they leave this、um, crystallized form of their ability. So Miriam, the main character, has、uh, in, uh, crystals embedded into her. So her crystals link to the demon's crystals. And she's able to absorb their power and be able to use it、um, as an ability to,、uh, to attack、uh, demons again. And can you give us、uh, some examples of those abilities? So, in this case, えっと、デュラハンマーの頭を振り回すヘッドフレイルっていう技であったりとか、まあ、例えば水を吐き出す悪魔がいたらその水を吐き出すものがあるんですけどもそれ以外にも、まあ、今攻撃に
攻撃のシャードなんですがそれ以外にも、まあ、早く移動できたりとかジャンプできたり高くジャンプできたりとかそういうシャードも移動系のシャードもありますので、まあ、それを攻略に使っていくことになります。So, for example, we have an enemy called Dula Hammerhead,、mm. and this enemy uses its own head to attack the player. So, he'll be swinging his own head at the player. And when、uh, Miriam absorbs his、uh, a shard, she's able to also、uh, attack the same way using the Dula Hammerhead. We also have another enemy、uh, named Seema, and he's.、Um, He、uh, shoots out a water, like water at the enemy,、uh, at, at the player.、Yeah. So she's able to use that as an ability. But we also have other shards where it's more of like a movement type of、um, mm-hmm. ability. So she's able to、uh, run faster or jump to a higher place. So we have all different kinds of shards. Interesting. Okay, and you guys just released、uh, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon, which is、uh, more of an 8 bit style、uh, spin off game. Can you talk about the decision to,、uh, to put that out first before Bloodstained? I played through it, I think it's awesome. えっと、今回は、えっと、ブラッド・ステインのカース・オブ・ザ・ムーンが、えっと、発売されて、まあえっと、リチャール・オブ・ザ・ナイトの前にあのリリースされたんですけど、まあえっと、これはあのど,どのような、まあ、ポジションというかどの,どのような感じでこのゲームが先にリリースされて、まあ後から、まあ、ブラッド・ステインのリチャール・オブ・ザ・ナイトが出てど,どういうふうにその関,関連性がありますか、えっと、関連性としましては、まあ、あの本編の前にちょっと盛り上げる。ようにっていう感じでそのカース・オブ・ザ・ムーンがあ,のあるんですけれども、えー、とポジション的な話をすると完全スピンオフ作品であるので単独で遊べるような形になっていますただリッチャー・オブ・ザ・ナイトとちょっと関連性があってちゃんと関連性があるように、えー、そこら辺は、えー、と監修をしてましてで、まあ、この後リッチャー・オブ・ザ・ナイトを遊んだ時にあれここがもしかしたらそあそこだったと違うのかなみたいな感じの,あの印,象印象というかそういう。まあ、そういうふうに思っていただけるとすごく嬉しいかなと思っています。So, Bloodstained Curse of the Moon、uh, released、uh, earlier than、uh, Ritual of the Night to sort of、um, bring a hype to the main game. And this is a spin off、um, game that's a, that has a connection to the main game, but not, a, not like a, a direct、um, prequel or anything. It's a spin off game. But when you play Ritual of the Night, you'll see that there are certain parts of the game where it's like, hey, I saw that in Curse of the Moon. Oh, so this is where it kind of connects. And、uh, we, we hope that players will be able to catch that reference. Uh, in Ritual of the Night. Well, it definitely、uh, did its job then. It's got me very hyped for Bloodstained. When are we going to get to play Ritual of the Night? えっと、それはもう私にとってすごい楽しみにしていますと。で、えっと、リチュアル・オブ・ザ・ナイトはあのいつ頃にあの遊べられますかえっとですね、まだちょっとリリースには言えないんですけれども、えー、もうすぐあの発表できるかと思いますね、思いますので、それまでちょっとお待ちください。So,、um, we can't disclose the release date yet, but、um, we'll, be, we'll be announcing that very soon.、Uh, have you, is it going to be this year? Is it going to be this year? So, we'll be announcing it this year, but we won't be、uh, saying when it will be released just yet. Fair enough. Well, I very much look forward to it. Thank you so much for coming by the IGN stage. Thank you. Stay tuned, more to come from our final day of coverage here at E3 2018 after this. Not only is IGN the world's biggest media brand for games and entertainment, but we also have a team of some of the world's biggest fans of your favorite franchises. From breaking news and exclusives, never before seen looks at movies and games, to reviews, let's plays, and live streams, IGN brings you all the coverage you need no matter where you are. Whether you're on IGN.com, the IGN app,